And one of the most common questions people ask, does it matter if my probiotics get warm? Will that kill my probiotics? And thankfully, a systematic review answers this question. Hey everyone, welcome back. This is Dr. Monica Russo, DC. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Bridgeport, a practicing clinician and a clinical researcher. One of the areas I'm most passionate about is gut health. One of the tools in the gut health kit that is the most effective are probiotics. And one of the most common questions people ask, does it matter if my probiotics get warm? If they were shipped to me in the freezer pack melted, or if I left them out on the counter or they're in the car and the car got hot, will that kill my probiotics? And thankfully, a systematic review answers this question. Best data point we got because this was a systematic review of 40 trials looking at about 4,000 patients. So what did this study tell us? Well, good news. It doesn't seem to matter if your probiotics get warm, they're actually just as effective. But don't take my word for it. Let's look at this paper by Zorzella, great name by the way, and colleagues published in Beneficial Microbes 2017. Here are a few quotes from the study. Overall, the study is comparing modified probiotics. So this was heat killed probiotics. Researchers intentionally warmed up probiotics to kill them. Remember, the current definition of a probiotic are live microorganisms that exert a beneficial impact on the host. So these weren't alive. They were killed with heat, right? So overall, the study is comparing modified or heat-killed probiotics to identical living probiotic strains. We found that 75% were similar in efficacy, but only 10% found superiority so again, this tells us that 75% of the time, if a probiotic was killed, it was just as effective. Continuing, surprisingly, modified, again, killed probiotics were not significantly different in efficacy compared to living strains in pediatric and adults for either preventing or treating various diseases in a number of trials. Remember, there were 40 clinical trials that were summarized. So it's not a cherry pick. This is the best data point to date that we have to answer this question. Now let's go a little bit further and unpack a few of the details. Because one of the things that I want to help you better understand is we don't, or we may not need to be so fastidious with how we think about probiotics. And this quote, and I'll show you an image also, really helps us understand that the mechanisms, the multifold mechanisms through which probiotics exert their beneficial impact don't seem to be deterred when they are heat killed or modified as the researchers framed it or termed it in this study. So quoting again, many of the pharmacological activities of living strains were also found in the heat treated microbes, including bacterial cytal activity against pathogens, meaning they secrete antimicrobial peptides, as I've been saying for years. Interference with pathogen attachment, so it prevents you from having stuff grow inside of you that you don't want. And preservation of the so important intestinal tight junctions, prevention of leaky gut, potentially the healing of leaky gut, which has been shown in a handful of trials with probiotics, even if they're killed in this case, they still exert that impact. And this is the image that I, I found or an image that really helps to kind of portray this. So what you're looking at here is a slice of the intestine, the intestinal lumen with the intestinal lining or epithelium. And along the lining, you see these blue little rectangular circles. These are probiotics. So when probiotics are hanging out there, as you see in the first section of the image, probiotics literally secrete these inhibitory compounds that don't allow pathogens to survive. This is one of the reasons why I've been really trying to amend this erroneous belief in the SIBO community amongst others 
that probiotics shouldn't be used in those with SIBO. It misses this data. It misses this point, which is probiotics literally inhibit pathogens. And as the quote a moment ago illustrated, they're bactericidal, they're antibacterial. Now, additionally, probiotics prevent pathogens, and we could also argue dysbiosis and fungi probably because probiotics have been used successfully to treat dysbiosis and fungal overgrowth. The probiotics compete for residency in the epithelium. So if you don't want certain microbes setting up shop in the lining of your gut, the probiotics will live there and therefore there won't be somewhere for these things you don't want to live. Additionally, they compete for nutrients. So your probiotics use nutrients and they prevent these bad bugs from using them and therefore discourage them from living. And then finally, there is direct antagonism, kind of synonymous with these other few. And this ties into the final point here I've written into this schematic. Therefore, we have less leaky gut or as depicted in one of the previous quotes, there are healthier tight junctions. So this is what the probiotics do or part of the mechanisms through which probiotics exert their healthful impact. But remember, these were also demonstrated in the heat killed probiotics. So it's great news. Again, it tells us that probiotics, even when heat killed or dead, are beneficial for a person. Now, what about adverse events? Maybe you could argue, well, do the probiotics spoil? Do they form some sort of Franken bacteria that we don't want if they're left out in the sun, if they get too hot, what have you? Another quote from Zorzella and colleagues. Among studies reporting adverse events, the rate and types of adverse events were largely similar between the groups for most RCTs randomized control trials. We did not find that modified probiotics killed were overwhelmingly safer than either living probiotics or placebo. So they're not any different. They don't have a higher incidence of adverse events. More good news. Now, just to quickly touch on this, what conditions were studied the fact that this was a systematic review, again, of 40 trials, about 4,000 patients, should indicate there's probably a number of conditions studied, as you see here, within the realm of gut health, diarrhea, IBS, and H. pylori eradication. So again, heat-killed probiotics had similar effectiveness for all these GI conditions. Immune health, treatment of non-GI infection, atopic dermatitis, or essentially skin breakouts, and allergy, all similar outcome for heat killed as compared to intact probiotics. Metabolism, obesity, even though the impact on obesity is fairly small with probiotics, it doesn't, again, seem to matter if the probiotic was heat killed or it was alive. And then finally, similar efficacy for pancreatitis and for uterine cancer. So really exciting to see all of this data pouring in, showing us that again, heat killed or intact seem to have essentially the same effect. So what are the practical implications of this finding or these findings? Well, maybe we should update the definition of probiotics because remember up until now, the contemporary definition is live microorganisms that exert a positive impact on the host. So maybe that should just be organisms, right? Including live and heat killed. I mean, this is up for debate, but I think this is one very compelling data point encouraging us to relax the definition of probiotics. Also, not being concerned if probiotics became warm, didn't ship with the freezer pack or their freezer pack was melted. This is something that we'll get uh, questions about. And understandably so, sometimes people are like, oh my God, you know, the, the freezer pack was frozen. I want to return my probiotics and get a, a fresh batch. I understand where that comes from. If you're investing in your health, you want to make sure you're getting the best materials, the, the best supplements in this case. 
However, I've also tried to champion this message of being a bit relaxed with how we look at diet, how we look at lab results, how we look at maybe the uber special form of the vitamin that you must take. Because a lot of times when we have data to answer the question, as Zorzella helps us with today, we see that we don't have to be that fastidious. And then additionally, perhaps, and this is my speculation, hence the asterisk next to this, but perhaps it doesn't matter if a probiotic is past its expiration date. Now, my thinking behind this is if you have a probiotic within the expiration window, meaning it's still viable, and then you warm it up and kill it, and it's still effective, maybe that's no different than a probiotic that wasn't warmed up to kill it, but is past the expiration date. That hasn't been proven. Zorzella and colleagues did not study that. That's my inference. But I'll offer that because sometimes people will say, well, I'm two months past the expiration date. Do I drop $30, $70, $100, whatever it is, for another batch of probiotics? Or can I use what I currently have? I would infer you probably could. Again, hasn't been shown my speculation, but I think it's reasonable nonetheless. And then the final point here, just as I've been kind of intonating, generally being less fastidious about probiotics. They work, if they got warm, if they were left out, doesn't really seem to matter. In fact, we've shared on the podcast before one study that found if you added probiotics to your coffee, as long as the coffee wasn't too hot, there was actually an enhancement of the effect. And I believe the cutoff temperature was 185 Fahrenheit. I could be wrong on that, but it was hot enough to where I don't think anybody would be drinking liquid at that temperature. So those are a few practical implications I'm taking from Zorzella's paper. Um, so hopefully this helps you. One of the sort of bedrock principles that I'm always excited to share with you are how can we be less anal about our health? How can we be more practical? Do we need the uber awesome probiotic that was shipped on dry ice or the one that only opens up in the large intestine or whatever it is? Or do we need the special vitamin that is supposed to be more bioavailable? In some cases, the answer is yes, but for the most part, as I've been previewing the literature now for almost 10 years, what you see is it doesn't really tend to matter. And oftentimes these things are manipulated by supplement companies to try to position their products as being better than other products. And you see this with those who are using freezer packs and saying our products, our probiotics always arrive cold or those that were then uh, maybe claiming that they're shelf stable, which we do for our products. But the, the point I'm making there is even that, given these data, doesn't seem to matter too much. Now, I do think it's reasonable to use shelf stable packaging that reduces moisture. But again, does it make a huge difference? Probably not. And similar with certain vitamin forms like methylated folate versus folic acid, doesn't seem to make a big difference as we've covered in some other study reviews that we've outlined on the podcast in the past. So all of this to give you practical advice so that you can change your diet, use supplements, what have you, and not be overly concerned about the fastidious details because there does appear to be this law of diminishing returns where some intervention, some focus is helpful. But then we can go beyond this point for which now it becomes antithetical to health and healing, whether it's due to worry or cost or all of the above. So great finding by Zorzella published in Beneficial Microbes that tells us that heat killed probiotics seem to be about as effective as live and intact. Hopefully this helps you with how you use probiotics and hopefully prevents you from maybe throwing out a probiotic that was shipped warm, left in the car, on the counter, or what have you. Okay, this is Dr. Michael Ruscio. I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>